strange. But interesting enough, she still says, I wish I did not have this accent. So in the same way as, you know, I get up in front of you and I wish I had, part of me wishes I had a Canadian accent because, um, of course, you're always negotiating, you know, your, your identity, you know, as, as you speak. Uh, and that is the kind of connection between language, accent and identity. So as I've argued that every time language learners speak, they are not only exchanging information with their interlocutors, they are organizing and reorganizing a sense of who they are and how they relate to the social world. They are, in other words, engaged in identity construction and negotiation. And so this is something that, um, that I think, and you know, I'm sure even in this conference, you know, every time we speak, and especially if you're an English language learner, um, there is that sense in which you're kind of negotiating the, your power to impose reception on others, how you get taken up within a particular context, how you, your identity is positioned. And in fact, if you look at some of the more traditional kind of concepts of identity, um, we've often seen that the notion of identity as being um, presented in, 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 uh, in dual terms as good or bad, or motivated or unmotivated, anxious, confident, introvert, extrovert, extrovert. But in fact, in a lot of the more, more um, post-structural and critical theories of identity, what you see is people who are sometimes motivated, sometimes unmotivated, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes confident, sometimes inhibited. So we are not in a sense unified that often the, the conception of identity in the field and in the 60s, 70s, a very humanist notion that you are, um, there is one real me, there is one real me. Whereas the kind of more critical conception is that we have multiple identities that we negotiate over time and place. So what exactly, though, does that mean for the field of language learning and teaching? So if you just have a look at Martina, another adult woman, who says, I feel uncomfortable using English in the group of people whose English language is their mother tongue, because they speak fluently without any problems, and I feel inferior. So this was a woman, in fact, uh, from, from the Czech, well, it was Czechoslovakia at that time. She spoke a number of languages. She was a quantity surveyor. She was a highly competent woman who felt inferior. So and I'm sure that that is very much the experience of, of, of many adult immigrants who come not only to Canada, but I'm sure to the U.S., who have so much to contribute, but yet because they cannot speak English fluently, feel positioned as, as inferior. But if you have a look then at, at the conditions under which these learners speak, so we look at Martina, in restaurant was working a lot of children, but the children always thought that, I, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe some broom or something. They always said, go and clean the living room. And I was washing the dishes and they didn't do nothing. They talked to each other and they thought I had to do everything. And I said, no, the girl is only 12 years old. She's younger than my son. I said, no, you are doing nothing. You can go and clean the tables or something. So when I see that, what I find so interesting here is that if you look, think of some of the classic theory, she could have been seen as somebody with a high affective filter, right? She felt inferior, but she did claim the right to speak. So how did she do that? She didn't claim the right to speak as the immigrant woman. She claimed the right to speak as the mother. She looked at her, in fact, these were just youngsters, you know, working in, you know, in, in the restaurant that she was working in, and she reframed her relationship to those, her, her co-workers, not as co-workers, but as adult child, as parent child. And so from that position, she could speak. So that is the power of the theory of, of, in a sense, multiple identities. It's not just that we have multiple identities, which I think we would all agree, but the point being that we can speak from some identities uh, and, 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 and we are silenced within the context of other identities. And this has profound implications for teaching. Because if, as a teacher, you see a child silenced or, or not speaking, the question that the challenge for you as a teacher is, um, what identity position can this student speak from? Are there other identity positions that will place this student in a more powerful position from which to speak? So that is the, you know, that's the power of the theory, the multiplicity of identity is that we speak, we can speak from different subject positions. And then the challenge for the teacher is how can we identify more powerful identities uh, that, 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 that students can uh, appropriate? So if you have a look at this wonderful data from a very dear friend and colleague, Helene Tuhi, we've done a lot of 
collaborative work together and she did some amazing work with, with youngsters in schools and these are little kindergarten kids and uh, yesterday Concepcion was talking about how kindergarten children come so enthusiastic into class and we all know that little enthusiastic little children who come into class and how is it that some kids you know thrive in schools and others get lost and you know so often teachers think that you know maybe the problem is with them you know maybe what have I done as a teacher you know how can I what can I do but sometimes what we don't always see is that there's of course a whole subculture happening you know within the classrooms and in the playgrounds that impacts of course whether you know kids have the capacity or the opportunity to speak so this is an example of Julie, who was an English language learner, who actually gained uh, access to conversations in her uh, kindergarten or grade one classroom, as opposed to Surjit, who was another English language learner who was not successful. So I just wanted to share with you, you know, in a sense, we, you know, we, we think power operates, you know, by the time you turn 13, we all know that our children are much more powerful than we are when they're about 13, 14. But believe me, when, even when they're six or seven, kids have power. So this is Alice, who is a native speaker of English, and they're doing a craft, gluing triangles together. And Alice says to Julie, you're copying me. Julie says, no. And Alice is silent, and Julie says, where'd you get that? Alice says, I can't tell you. And then Julie says, nice. And she shows Kelly some shiny paper. And then Julie laughs and says, I did it the wrong way. And Alice says, don't copy. Julie just kind of ignores her. I'm going to do this. Alice says, it's not funny, Julie. Let's see. Guess where I'm going to stick it. I'm making this for my mom. She was sick. She was having a big cough. So obviously not much of a conversation happening there between Alice and Julie. Julie trying to kind of enter into a conversation without any success. <coughs> Well, what happens, very interesting, is Oscar comes into the picture, another native speaker, and he comes over and he whispers to Julie. And then Alice suddenly said, Julie, remember no secrets in the school? What did he tell you? And he says, one, 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 one. And he, she deliberately obscures. And then Alice, it's going to hurt my feelings. 